Ding. We're up. All right. Hi, this is not Paul, but Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, as you can see from the screen, we are going to talk today about the famous Breakwater Festival, the estuary conference here in Mannheim, Germany, which is coming up at the end of this month, uh, end of October in just three weeks. Uh, so if you want to get your ticket, you can see the link below the video and get your ticket and take part in this amazing event, which will take place from October 27 to 29. And almost all speakers of uh, Breakwater Festival are here today, um, except for Thomas Steininger. He couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, but it was hard to find another date. So we are just trying to do this today. And uh, we already had one offline meeting with all speakers. And the goal for today is to do a little warm up for the event. And um, yeah, um, as I said, Breakwater Festival, um, in Mannheim, Germany, and the subtitle is Paths, People, and Places, Navigating the Journey of Meaning. And we have here in this circle today, David and me, who are organizing the event together with Cassidy, who also isn't able to participate today, but uh, like we are the, the three of us, we are organizing this event. And we have our speakers, Paul Vanderclay, Andrea Lewis, and Aaron Van Os. Welcome, everybody. And Thank you. yeah, you're welcome. And the first question uh, we have to you as speakers uh, for us for a little warm up is how do you feel about the approaching festival? And uh, any one of you can go first. I, I've had two conversations with Thomas. One has been posted on my channel, and the other one will be posted. And I'm I'm super excited to spend some time with him and and continue our conversation the second conversation we we sort of pursued more um spiritual bodies and how they work in terms of meaning and in this world and Ooh. so i'm and the rest of you i know a little bit more than i knew thomas i didn't know him as well so i found him to be an excellent conversation partner and so i'm i'm really looking forward to being together I guess I, I I have the same though. I don't know. I, I have never met Andrea in person, so I'm really curious. Uh, I've never that. met any of these folks in person, <laughs> so don't worry. Okay, so that's good. That lowers some of the pressure. Yeah. Um, but I'm very excited, precisely because like I'm both a fan of the arts as well as of uh, philosophical and spiritual ideas, and I guess that's something that Andrea very nicely uh, combines in what she's talking about, and then. I am some I've sometimes been afraid that even though we organize events uh, within like this little corner that it tends and and the goal of estuary is the sweet and the salt water and combining those two that it still tends towards more church goers lately which I'm obviously positive about because you know that it's a, it's a good development in many respects but at the same time it feels that that might also uh, threaten the welcoming of also new people to the space. And that's why I'm very excited that Thomas is here too, as kind of more this Ferveki uh, correspondent. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, he has his, his own project. So I'm also very intrigued by the breadth sort of that, we're, that we can expect during the festival. Looking forward. Mm. So how am I feeling? I'm feeling like super unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being truthful, although it was good that um, I was asked to provide my talking points Same. because I didn't have them at all until I was asked. So, but, but they sound uh, uh, very good. So I'm very excited about your talk. So okay. <laughs> so well, good. Well, I'm excited and nervous. It's one thing to be turning on my computer and the lights and the, making sure my microphone's working and then okay time to, to talk but it is a completely different thing to be speaking in front of people um so i i mean i hope it'll be good i'm i'm feeling i'm being way too honest right now i'm feeling kind of nervous about the fact that I'm having to speak in front of people, but I'm happy that I'm not alone. Thanks, Paul. 
<laughs> for being my conversation partner for this. Um, and I, but I think it will be good. I'm actually really looking forward to um, the get togethers and the little chats and because though that's what it really is. Like being a speaker is is fine and the speaking that I'll be doing is good, but I do think the the, the talking after will be very um like rich. So I am looking forward to that. Um because I don't find that difficult. I mean maybe you like remind me of your names. Can we wear name tags? Other than that, that's the only nervous thing I have about names, like names. But I'm fine to chat with people. It's the, I, you know, we'll see how it goes on stage. It'll be fun. It'll probably be fine once it gets going. But your uh, Andrea, your idea is to have Paul on the stage as well for for your talk, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Be, yes. Being that I I cannot do a speech for an hour and a half. <laughs> So. And do do you want do you want to briefly uh, tell Paul your your uh, your bullet points you sent us? Uh, maybe that's also good for his. Oh right! Oh yeah! So I suppose maybe you'd want to know. Although I do think that Paul would be like up to just doing on the fly, but like I guess it'd be a good idea. So what are they? Um, okay, so I want to talk about um, like with the modern world being changing so much particularly for gender. So I'm looking at male and female because my channel focuses mostly on um, the feminine within stories or film or things like that. And so with me trying to follow along with the theme, I am, actually, I think I might just pull them up on the message I sent you because I don't have them memorized. But yeah, it, yeah. it basically has to do with how do we navigate um, being um, a man and a woman in these times, but that's too. I, I promise they are better. I just need to. They, they are. They are good, and I, I I like them especially. Also, I mean, um, Aaron wants to talk about Nietzsche, and you want to talk about masculine and feminine, and it's also the, the journey of meaning. It's it's also like uh, topics that, for example, Jordan Peterson, uh, with whom all of this started, um, is very are topics of him as well. So I think mm -hmm. that fits together very good mm -hmm. okay so i picked pull them up um unless we want to move on but i i have them here great so so paul take notes no just kidding i have them here you don't have to take notes. i'm, I'm recording this <laughs> oh right Taking notes for me okay okay so the title of the talk is how to find our way in a world of deconstruction um and the subtitle is finding the role of the masculine and the role of the feminine so how do we identify within our role as masculine or feminine in a time when lines are deeply blurred and we have a few models to look to? Why does understanding these roles matter? Uh, how do stories or narratives help to remind us and to understand the ideal masculine slash feminine? Uh, why do modern stories so often present role reversals where the it's a woman playing a masculine-esque character, for example, say Captain Marvel. Um, and why do stories, um, oh, sorry, how does this reflect the deconstruction of modern society? So those are what I would like to focus on. It doesn't have, like, those are just the talking points. We don't have to exactly, I'll probably get some specific questions, but it, I just want to know in how do we find our purpose, meaning, striving on our road? Um, I imagine a map. Uh, when when I've heard the name of this festival, I'm just imagining like making our way in life and a map. You know, a a sort of Tolkien esque type map is how I imagine it. You know, and there's um, like Merkwood. I feel like we're going through Merkwood right now as a society. Anyway. So the idea is I just want to how so there's a lot of different things you can look to to be like how do I navigate who I am and my journey through and and the masculine and feminine those are aspects that are I think really important and being comfortable and grounded in these things I think helps us to move through life well so but but then why 
So that sounds it. very interesting. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Paul, when you hear this, uh, can you imagine yourself on stage and talking about this topic? I think I'm going to have to do some preparation. Um, I think, yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts, but it's, I'm, I want to do a little bit more reading and thinking about it because I think it's a vitally important topic. I mean, part of our dilemma is that there's so much available to us. And that's one of the huge changes in modernity that men and women themselves have so many more options for how, for the decisions that we make going forward in life. You know, even, even just the optionality of family, which has developed in the last, you know, in the last number of decades, how this is, I mean, this is a massive change that in many ways we've just sort of taken for granted. And then of course the, I mean, part part of what's part of what's thrown women into the workforce, uh, into well, not just the workforce, but into career pursuits, was the shock of the um, divorce revolution, where suddenly women had assumed a level of support in the world, and then suddenly, oh well, that man can divorce you and you know, a lot of poverty is the product of divorce. Uh, children often stayed with women and men sort of went their own way. I heard a really interesting interview with Nancy Percy, who's just written a new book about this. And she goes back to the Industrial Revolution and sort of traces a lot of these key moments. And so that's just within my lifetime in the 70s when women discovered that if men were going to abandon them, or no longer be faithful partners with them, then they were they would they might very well just be sort of subject to poverty, them and their children. And so that sent a whole cadre of parents telling their daughters, well, we would really like you to marry and uh, have children, but you need a plan B. So by the way, in your 20s, make sure you set get the footings down for a good career so that if plan A doesn't work out, you at least have plan B and you won't be plunged into poverty. So I don't know if that's, you know, it's interesting that we'll be talking in Europe and my impression is that the European safety net, social safety net is quite a bit more vigorous as is the Canadian than the American one. But this had a deep impact in the United States where even conservative parents look at their daughters and say, you need the educational footing for a career because men are no longer reliable. Mm. So, and marriage is no longer a safe haven. So there's, there's a lot. And then, and that I think subsequently a lot of the conversations now with respect to women who are basically following a career track. Mm -hmm. Well, now suddenly, oh, you can have it all. Can I really, um, you know, can I really develop a career? and raise children, especially if the man is for the most part on a career track so that he can bring money in to give us a certain level of life. I mean, it's a huge topic. So yeah, we'll talk. You know, yeah, children become accessories and you outsource um, what you can't do at home. Yeah. And so that, and that gets into demographic collapse. Family sizes are smaller. Children are no longer um, economic assets. They're economic liabilities. Um, and then, and then children also sort of become these lifestyle accessories where, mm -hmm. um, we, I want to mold my child so that my child enhances my experience of life. Well, that's a little selfish. So th there's a ton there. So we'll, yeah. sure we'll have a lot. Don't, to I don't have the conversation too early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. I, I think you will, you will just have, uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it and you will have enough food for talk. Um, Paul, you, you already talked to Thomas two times and you heard now what Andrea um, is planning to talk about. Have you already uh, thought of your, your speech, your talk at Breakwater Festival? Do you have an idea what you want to talk about? 
Oh, not yet. Um, this is all helpful. You know, as with the um, the Chino Conference and the Thunder Bay Conference, the warm up conversations are really helpful. I, it doesn't take me a long time to prepare a talk, and I do it. I do it every week. Um, so, but it, but you know, I the intersection of where Thomas and I spoke with we, I mean, one of the things that interested him about me was. I think a, a big question in this little corner, which is what is the relationship between uh, people who are sort of rooted in a historical religious tradition and those who are more out there in terms of a generic meaning crisis. And, you know, obviously from the last festival, a good number of people in our community have sought to reroute themselves in religious traditions and some of them orthodoxy of course a very old and deep religious tradition others to reroute let's say in a protestant tradition that perhaps they never fully left or one that's available some catholicism so i think um you know i i think these are all the topics that we continually sort of circle around and and so for thomas who grew up Roman Catholic and has sort of been in, let's say the Vervakian space where they're trying to reconstruct something without necessarily the institutional and community connections. I This was actually going to be the first topic we proposed for Chino, but um, some people didn't sort of like the framing. But I, I, I really do think it is in many ways the real or one of the real deep issues in the corner, similar to what Andrea is pointing out in terms of, well, how do I proceed as a man or a woman? And this is, is it really plausible and possible to th this question that John Verbeke says, are the legacy religions tapped out? Obviously, many people believe no, so they've gone back to them. Others look at the legacy religions and say they're not re really a viable option. And I've I've sort of been in the middle thinking that, well, I'm, I'm certainly not leaving Christianity, but I tend to think that we're going to see yet another, we're going to see Christianity do what it has done many times in terms of continue to sort of adapt and shape reshape as it engages all of this technological and social disruption so it'll be mm -hmm. probably along those lines it'll be what we're always talking about but probably just continuing now with the speakers and the people in the room and i think especially for me it's tremendously stimulating to be in a european context because europe is so fascinating in that on one hand you have the roots of many of the, the Christianities in North America. And at the same time, you've got Europe is even more deeply secular. So mm -hmm. I think Europe is a fascinating place for these conversations. Absolutely. And Germany as well. Yeah. Yeah. But well, Germany is Europe, isn't it? Germany's in many ways yeah. the center of Europe. I mean, <laughs> it was, I mean, it was the intellectual vanguard, you know, coming in the, you know, to the peak of the, of modernity. Um, and so, I mean, almost all of the major philosoph modern philosophical movements and theological movements have their beginnings in Germany. The English in many ways sort of adapted some things and the Dutch are always sort of in the middle. And so, no, Germany's, we're just going to be a little ways from Heidelberg, which is, you know, the namesake and the origin of probably the most important document in the Christian Reformed Church, which is the Heidelberg Catechism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also will be having a lot of Dutch people coming to the Breakwater Festival. And um, yeah, Aaron, um, could you also share your, your um 
points for your talk you want to talk about Nietzsche uh, maybe you can just um, yeah uh, go into this a little bit that would be good of course yeah I think my experience was a little bit similar uh, to Andreas in, in terms of feeling a little bit unprepared even though at the same time probably similar to Andrea like you've been working with this for years now so so it's it also makes complete sense that something is just going to show up uh while we're working towards it but yet but yes like my um I send you a tentative title for the talk uh which is right now uh Nietzsche and Christ and then it's like reconcilable or irreconcilable responses to the meaning crisis uh, this is somewhat subject to change because I think there is more to it. And since the subject or like the, the theme is peoples and and, and places that and, and, and paths, I'm interested in that too, because I feel like someone like uh, Nietzsche, I've really related in a very personal manner to. And, and that's why like I, I, I can identify with some, something that John Verveke says, when you meditate so long on an author that at some point you start seeing the world through their eyes sometimes like especially with someone like Nietzsche it can even be become a bit scary to do that at times um, but it was a very powerful tool to really see like oh okay especially when I was going through uh, a difficult time in terms of my own understanding of religion uh, to really see like okay what am I willing to lose am I willing to give up and that's I think um, so there's lots of points where we can actually come to agree with sort of the, the 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 Nietzschean movement that is in my opinion also happening and I think people either consciously so you have people like uh, Uber Boyo like a, a, a YouTube channel and they very consciously identify themselves as sort of you know people who are in some ways followers of Nietzsche but Nietzsche influenced Jung and therefore Peterson he influenced Heidegger and therefore the whole phenomenological tradition and Derrida and so like there's so many things actually many how should I say it developments in our culture that are profoundly related to this individual and therefore I'm fascinated to see like okay is there something we can um, integrate in this sort of criticism of Christianity that he's bringing um, to a certain extent strengthening ourselves but then also trying to find out and that's why I want to make it a bit more personal so what I've done in preparation and I've done that over the past few years is look at a lot of his personal letters his uh also commentaries of like what, what other people who knew him intimately said about him which actually becomes kind of interesting because I think you get a much more Christian image of Nietzsche if you look at what people said about him if you look at some of his letters as opposed to when you just read you know the vitriolic text that he uh, keep sending out and I think if you do that you can kind of in a very interesting manner uh, see that there might be this extent to which actually integrating the Nietzschean criticism was of good help to Nietzsche himself and maybe could be and that's going to be a discussion that's why it's going to be an interactive lecture that I'm hoping to do um, it could be an interesting way of maybe strengthening you know uh, our own purposes and aims in this little corner of the internet because we're also trying to be open to external influences but then also to see like, okay, I want to take seriously the fact that Nietzsche went mad, like he went completely insane. And I want to be respectful to that and not just say, so anything goes and we should criticize whatever we want. And therefore to kind of start um, a conversation on what are the helpful strains of Nietzscheanism, for instance, and that can be anything. Like I, I think I mentioned in the points that I sent you that the, you have a strong Nietzschean vitalism culture, which is actually embodied probably best by people like Andrew Tate who in some ways you know like they they inspire young men and in other ways they're obviously very problematic so um, I want to have I want to try to have a nuanced debate um, based around the person of Nietzsche himself so I'm going to present probably a lot of his ideas of his texts of what other people said about him and then try to draw that like from the person Nietzsche to a broader cultural context and see to what extent this can be helpful or threatening and I'm not going to give the final answer there. That's going to come out, hopefully, in the conversation at the festival. So that's a short overview. Sounds great. great. Sounds great. Good. I yes. already have questions, so. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Nietzsche, I mean, Nietzsche is, I mean, if you look at Tom Holland's Dominion, which, you know, for me is also an important book. Tom, Nietzsche deeply influenced Tom Holland. A lot of Tom Holland's wrestling is around Nietzsche. And um, so, no, I think you're exactly right. And and Nietzsche is probably someone that this corner needs to pay more attention to. And I think in the broader way that you just laid it out, Aaron, I think that's tremendous. 
Yeah, I'm trying to make it as broad as possible and then sort of then zero back in on what can we actually do with this because otherwise it becomes too overwhelming like it did for Nietzsche himself. So yeah. we're going to try to balance that. But yeah, thank you, Paul. Nice. Sounds great. Andrea, you also had a comment on... No, I just had a, a question. So, well, Paul, why do you say he should be more... This corner should pay more attention? Like, why do you... Why well, specifically I, again, Nietzsche? I, see I mean, obviously we're talking about him, but... Part of the deep... Part of what holds the interest of this corner is this question that Verveke, I think, nicely lays out this tension within Verveke about what he calls legacy religions and viability in a contemporary space. You know, nobody, Nietzsche seemed to, on one hand, bring one of the most devastating critiques of Christianity, but also at the same time raise the realization that we can't live without this you know when you kill god what does that mean because christianity is so deeply embedded even in its its great critics and so you know i mean and when you look at jesus himself on one hand a tremendous critic of the the, what was going on in terms of the religious patterns of his day, yet also, you know, very much going down to the roots and affirming the roots. And so in some ways, Nietzsche does a similar thing. And I think you're right, Aaron, that I, I'm by no means an expert on Nietzsche and I've paid not enough attention to him, but he also seems to have that, play that double role mm -hmm. of on one hand saying this this slave morality, does this really work? I mean, that's a deeply, that's deep renunciation. But on the other hand, can we really live without it? And when I just saw a Twitter thread that someone pointed me to the other day, where it was an atheist basically acknowledging Tom Holland's argument saying, yeah, all these atheists are just, they just deeply accept Christian morality. And we atheists need to get beyond Christian mm -hmm. morality, and I thought, oh wow, well, there's there's Nietzsche. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was his project, and that was actually his project, yeah. And and how successful was that project? And in fact, would anybody buy it? Because it seems to me that I I I don't see any real alternative to the morality of Christ that He has given to us, and mm -hmm. I don't see anybody, you know. Okay, oh, Andrew Tate, all right. Is that really where we want to go? Men and women together? I don't think so. <laughs> you can see the relations like between like, or the connections between the talk of Andrea and mine and therefore also yes. of yours. So this is going to be hopefully fascinating to combine mm -hmm. all. Yeah. all right, one more question. Sorry, is the what so why did he go mad? Because he couldn't reconcile mm -hmm. these two things? Like, well, yes, at least like that would be my um uh, argument i can say more about it like obviously like a, a common thesis that he got syphilis but there's actually never been confirmed um what seems more likely and that's also what friend commentaries like they reveal this about him if you look at his um his van so his his, his his madness letters that he wrote out after he went insane he had his med mental mm -hmm. breakdown about half of them he signed off with Dionysus, like the Greek god Dionysus. Yeah, that's okay. really the anti-Nietzschean strain. And the other half, very interestingly, he signed off with the crucified. So it's almost like, okay, in his madness, he already opposes these two. And then also like the last sentence before, like in his final book that he published, or that was actually published after his death, was also, have I been understood Dionysus versus the crucified? And I'm actually trying to argue that both are fundamentally important. And you can see this and what friends say about him too, is like, he was trying to balance both of them, but to such an extent that he couldn't anymore. That And René Girard had also, also has interesting things to say about this. Perhaps I'll have more time at the festival to explain, but that's where I think, yeah, this will be difficult. So where mm. should we go to until what level? Interesting. Okay, this is going to be good. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. I think there are really some already some great topics on the table for the festival. And yeah, Andrea and Aaron, you um, already have yours worked out quite detailed and Paul and Thomas are kind of in the process, but 
What I'm also very excited about is is the different formats. Uh, Aaron, you, you mentioned you want to give kind of an interactive lecture. And I don't know, should we shortly run through the program that people can get a better idea? Can, can you give me the screen sharing, Paul? Then I can show something visual. OK, there you go. Thank you. Okay. Can you already see it? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the schedule for uh, Breakwater Festival. And on Friday, 27th of October, um, it's just, uh, yeah, just arrival and uh, basically a campfire and open get together. And there will be also a bit of music and we have the possibility to be outside and in the venue and David is also um, kind of our host because this is a church, um, a church um, venue um, with different buildings, and we have space outside and inside. And Dave and his wife they run several projects there. I don't know, Dave, do you want to uh, tell a bit more about it or? Well, we my wife runs the community center called the Villa. And we are on the property that also belongs to the church. So they have extra space from the sanctuary to the fellowship hall. But we have lots of outdoor space. And we're hoping the weather will be nice, especially for Friday evening. We'll have a campfire and we'll be we'll have food to I think we'll sell food that evening. There'll be a good price to get like bratwurst and that type of thing um to enjoy around the fire i think we'll even have songs and we're hoping good weather for that evening because i think we'll have plenty of outdoor space throughout the whole weekend um and yeah hopefully yeah that'll that'll work out otherwise we have plenty of indoor space oh yes oh yes yeah and then uh saturday um is going to start with paul's lecture and the topic uh will he will he will work on that and then uh we have Thomas uh, Steininger, his lecture. And the special thing about that is that he wants to do it in a fishbowl uh, setting, which is kind of a new um, format for for here, for Bridges of Meaning and Estuary, because it's um, he said that he could um, engage the whole room with this method. So we are excited about that. And then we have lunch and then Andreas and Paul's live podcast about masculine and femininity in what you talked about. And then Aaron's lecture. And then after that, um, all speakers um, will reflect on the day. Then dinner and in the evening, something very special. We have a sacred harp singing. I don't know, did you hear about sacred harp before? anybody no no not at I all i can yeah david describe it i can say something to that yeah i've recently learned about this as well and back here in Mannheim, we've done it at the estuary now two times i think we've we've done the singing one of them to to practice for <laughs> for this event but we have uh somebody that is part of our estuary that uh, has participated these in years and then also can lead them and it's a way of doing of singing it's it's basically choir type mu music but it's very old hymnal uh that originates in new england and oh. is still sung in many parts around the world and it's sung in different cities in europe there's different or like groups that get together just to sing this hymnal um so it's like really old english text and the thing is that it's very popular among people that are Christian that are non-Christian. You, you know, I just talked to a friend uh, just just last week about this, inviting her to come. Uh, she's American. She's from Portland. She's like, oh, people in Portland love to sing Sacred Harp. And she's like, there's hardly any. I mean, it's many non <laughs> really? people that have to do with church and they come and sing. Um, so it's, I've heard it described. I just heard a pastor describe it here in Germany. He said it's the heavy metal of choir music. 
Um, oh, it is God. it is because it you sing quite loud and and it's more about uh, it doesn't sound as pretty, but it's very uh, participatory and very loud. And so it's a lot of fun. And and we actually have been having a lot of fun singing here in the estuary. So we're we're inviting people from the community and from Mannheim to participate. Uh, as part of our being able to use the facility here, the church wanted us to have one event that we could invite people from the community to. And so we decided on Sacred Harp as a way of participating. And uh, it, and there's a lot of people that will come specifically just because it's Sacred Harp singing. And so we're looking forward to that, doing that with people um, from Mannheim that will come for in the area to come and sing with us that evening. And it will be an experiment as many uh, as 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 many um things last year we had two movies with his um with his jonathan bijou uh, meaning wave orchestra and now we have another experiment and yeah of course it will be i mean people won't be trained in it it will it will be strange at the beginning but i think it will be it's a good it's a good experiment and yeah we like to do it at the Mannheim estuary so and then That's how um, we roll Yes, <laughs> exactly. And then on Sunday, um, we have a talk between Thomas and Aaron. And um, yeah, maybe uh, Aaron, uh, we should connect the two of you to that you can work on on that uh, point as well. Note to myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, because we thought it would be good to connect different speakers and Andrea is talking with Paul and we thought it would be good to have a slot for the two of you as well. And then uh, we have estuary small group discussions. And yeah, if you're off this corner, you know probably what that is. It's basically small groups breaking up and uh, they will have enough time to get to know each other, make a round of introductions and then basically talk probably about what what the experience of a weekend is and what's uh, yeah what your thoughts about it are and then um, last year in in Landa we also had this estuary panel and that was about bridges of meaning and Paul you were on stage uh, in that slot as well and this year we uh, will do it um, an estuary panel on the German community And some um, people of the German community will be on stage and discuss uh, the development of, of our community during the last years, um, online and offline, and our experiences. And yeah, just share experiences and what we learned. And afterwards, um, you speakers will have the possibility of closing thoughts. And that's basically the program for the festival. That's great. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. Very exciting. Oh, the weather looks lovely where you are, Paul. The weather, this is Northern California. The weather's always lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just true. Oh, it's And true. Um, do you guys have any questions or anything you want to add to what we discussed? I'm, I'm super excited about it. I mean, last year's festival I thought was tremendous and I really love the additions. I'm going to have to look up Sacred Harp on YouTube. I'm sure there's plenty of videos out there of it. And oh yeah, again, just um, getting to know, I hope a bunch of the people that came last year will be able to come again because there's a, you know, there's a, again, once you sort of do it again, The relationships build more deeply. Of course, I, I got to meet. Um, I haven't. I've, I met Aaron and Matthias last year in person, um, but I have never met Andrea or David in person. So, just really looking forward to all of this. Part of, you know, we focus on as as Andrea said, we focus on the um, on the talks and everything, and that's great. But just as with all of the other events, the For, for many people, the real payoff is, in fact, being together, building the relationships. And that's that's really where the that's re that's really what I'm excited about, because that's we can do the thinky talky stuff on the on the Zoom. But uh, being together, there's 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 nothing else like it. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm really lo looking forward to it uh, and especially indeed also those aspects, which is why. 
I think, and it seems like all the lectures are that to some extent, but like they have this interactive quality because I think we're all more interested in the emerging dialogue uh, between us and between the people there, as opposed mm -hmm. to sort of what we have to say and the concepts we want to share and we want other people to think the same things. It's like, I think we're also like, like, like Paul said, like we're still talking about this. Um, I also can't help like, and this might be, uh, I might be inspired by Peugeot, but I find it very fascinating in terms of the symbolism that the last conference was about the search for a spiritual home. And now we're meeting in a place which I think literally translated from German is man home, if I'm not mistaken, which I find also in terms of the gender dynamics, a fairly interesting uh, piece of symbolism. So hopefully we can also welcome uh, some of the women and have a more combined and mixed uh, gender dynamic going on. But no, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm meeting all of you and uh, going off the screen and hopefully more uh, fruits for indeed starting new communities, which is what I think we tried to do last year. Lots of places was successful, other places, it still needs a little bit more impetus. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it for sure. We get to see Cassidy's baby. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Oh, yes. <laughs> Andrea, do you have any closing thoughts? Hmm. Um, I, I really do hope that we can wear name tags. Like that's one of the things I really want to do because I'm very bad with names. Um, so that's just a suggestion um, for my sake. Um, Cassidy hates name tags. Oh, okay. Maybe you, the two of you can maybe the two of you can discuss that point. Okay, well, we'll have some time. Um, okay, well, now I'm just gonna have to like improve my memory with. How will Andrea know who I am without a name tag? I know. I, I I'll just be like, who are what? Who is this giant man <laughs> with a beard that looks like Santa? So, so okay. Closing remarks. I. I, I think it's going to be really fantastic. I I had I didn't go last year and like I almost feel a little impostery because I'm I'm not European. Um oh Paul. That's the puppy, nice. it is really existing. <laughs> Here is the puppy. Cute. Here's my jailer. Oh. Andrea, I, I think I think you uh your your talk sounds very very amazing honestly and uh, as Aaron said it's it's very uh, important also to um, have the perspective of women and um, I thank you for coming um, and to be our speaker well I, I do appreciate being included and so I guess I should feel more like a guest than an, an imposter <laughs> but I do I do really appreciate that the hospitality that's being extended to me and I think it's going to be, yeah, really a really enriching experience. And I hope to represent my gender well. <laughs> you will, you will. I think it's, it's just, I think it just uh, will be, will be working out very good. Um, Everything that's on the table is seems like a very good program, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I thank you all for participating and for coming. And I'm, I, last year I was excited. I it was my idea to start the festival, and people showed up. Paul came from U, the U.S. John Venang came, and now you all come. So, that's just brilliant, yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Thank well, you so much, also Matthias and Dave, and obviously Cassidy. Um, like for having us and for organizing all this, like it's such a wonderful task you're performing there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. Do you have any closing thoughts? Oh, I'm. We're excited. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm. I, I'm very excited to have everybody here in this space. There's going to be some other people helping out that are not going to be part of the festival. So somebody from behind the scenes. Oh, I don't know. It's just it gives a lot of energy uh, to be part of this. I like uh, I like doing this. I'm going to be cooking for you guys. So um, uh, this is, this is going to be fun. You guys are going to have a good time here. And uh, it's just going to be will cool. have a good time. You will have a good time <laughs> because uh, we have we have a nice place here. It's going to be this is going to be down to earth. You know, it's a community center. This is not the this is not the Four Seasons or a Hyatt. I don't know. What's a high-end hotel? No, this will be this will be, this will about be about people getting together. You'll have lots of time with each other. We'll have really good 
um, I think just downtime and a good space for that. Um, so I think that'll be like uh, Paul said, that's a big part of why you come is it's the people you meet and the conversations you have. And uh, we want to be good hosts. So we're looking forward to it. Definitely. Oh, and we're looking forward to meeting all of you out there who are oh, yes. coming to attend. And everybody who will still uh, will be buying a ticket. Thanks. <laughs> yes, if you've been wondering or, or hesitating, like just don't hesitate anymore. Make that purchase. <laughs> Right, that was a good ending, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll end thanks. the recording then. Yeah. Bye.